subject today is going to be uh, ways to uh, decorate pottery, you know, ways to surface finish your pottery that don't involve glaze. And, you know, uh, any of the ways I'm going to talk about can be combined with, you know, two or three different of these methods, and it can be combined with glaze as well. Uh, some of them. I guess there's some, like, you wouldn't want to glaze a, a burnished surface. But, but a lot of these, like, you could glaze a corrugated pot, for example. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could. So, um, so I'm not saying these are exclusive to glaze, uh, but they are alternatives. So I think a lot of people, and I'm not just potters, right? Um, if you're a, um, a carpenter, if you're a, um, a painter, if you're a, yeah, anything, right? A, a physical therapist. I mean, anything, right? You end up getting stuck in a rut. Like, this is the way I always do things. And it's easier. It's easier to just keep doing things the same way. Um, but that's not the way to maybe do your best work. It's good to kind of try different things. And so I think a lot of studio potters, you know, they learn that, you know, you make the pot like this and then you biscuit and then you glaze it. And then you, you know, there's a certain routine that they follow. And you get stuck in that rut and, you know, you're making pottery like everybody else in the studio. So uh, these are maybe some alternatives that will help you um, make your pottery stand out from everybody else's, uh, kind of bring it to the next level. These are ways that are often uh, centuries old. These are ways of making pottery uh, that are used all over the world. So I'm not just going to focus on a Native American techniques. I'm not just going to focus on New World techniques today. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to show some pictures of uh, Chinese pottery and, and contemporary pottery. So um, these are things that hopefully, no matter what, you know, where you're at in ceramics, uh, you find something you can apply. And we've got some people joining us from India and Alabama. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, so let's get started talking about, um, uh, some of these, uh, techniques. And then, you know, if you have questions along the way, just pop them in the chat and I will get to those. I won't wait till the end. I'll get to them, you know, try to, as they come in. So, um, I'll do my best. I'm working with a new microphone today. So if the audio level seems too low or too high, uh, give me a holler in the chat so I can adjust that. Okay. So, um, let me hold on. It's like walking and chewing gum, like I said before. I, you know, sometimes it's hard to do two things at once. So we're going to transition here, and hopefully the audio is still with us. And we're looking at, uh, this is a Native American uh, pot from here in the American Southwest. And these are, these are pretty, no, not common, but you do find these across a wide area, these particular kinds with the little spikes. And, uh, and they're called a, a Datura effigy pot. So... Uh, the sacred datura or the jimson weed plant, uh, which has some um, importance in Native American cultures uh, in the Southwest, it has a seed pod that's a little round, real spiky thing. I don't have a picture of it to show you, but it just it's just like a little, about the size of a golf ball and just covered in spikes. And so they believe that these pots like this are effigies of those that would be used maybe in some ceremony or something. So the first method I'm going to discuss uh, that is an alternative to glazing is applique. So just adding bits of clay to the outside of your vessel, you can make it look like all kinds of things. And that's a great way to kind of, um, you know, uh, do something different with your pottery. And like I said, this could be used in combination with glaze, in combination with slips or burnishing or other finishing methods. But applique can also be its own thing, which allows the texture of the clay to shine out. Uh, now I've got uh, another picture here, if I can get it to work. So this is um, this is from Peru. This is prehistoric Peru, and uh, it's a it's a human effigy, complete with clothing and face and everything, maybe hair uh, style. So uh, another really interesting use of applique to decorate the outside of a pot. And um, and the next one I'm going to show you uh, is a is a contemporary one that I found online. And this is, uh, you see there, and, and you know, th this could be glazed in the end. I'm not saying you couldn't use this with glaze, but you could use it without glaze as well. Uh, they've actually added uh, uh, heads of wheat, and then uh, they're using some kind of tool to kind of carve it and uh, make some designs on it. So another great way to uh, decorate the outside of a pot. Uh, so applique is the first one. Let's talk about uh, the next one I have here, which is graffito. So uh, in a scraffito, you actually paint the whole outside of the vessel with some kind of a color, uh, a slip, 
an underglaze, um, even even like a um, an oxide wash, like a, maybe this is like a manganese wash that's been uh, burnished in or something. I don't know uh, what they're using in this particular case. Uh, audio feed sounds perfect. Thanks for that. Um, and so you you paint the whole outside in this whatever color. It doesn't have to be black, but in this the cases I have here today, I think they're all black. And then uh, while it's still green, that is before it's fired, you carve you carve designs in it. You carve all those little intricate details, and then you fire it. And so it's kind of like reverse, right? You 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 paint a solid color, and then you carve out the designs you want. Um, let me show you the next example I have here. Uh, and, and that last pot was Mata Ortiz, uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. And I believe this is Mata Ortiz as well. They do a lot of scraffito down there. Uh, and this is uh, some birds, obviously. Beautiful, beautiful detail, unbelievable. So uh, you can do a lot of things with scraffito, and it's a great way. To, and, of course, you wouldn't want to glaze these. You'd re literally be covering up some of that detail with glaze. So the, the texture of the clay is allowed to be the star here or whatever the texture of the, the paint as well. And then uh, the final example I have, I only have three examples of each type, so we're going to cover these pretty quickly. Um, and this is um, a, by a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Osgood, who uh, lives in Colorado. And he also does uh, similar pottery to mine. He does um, uh, replica, prehistoric replica pottery. So he was at the Southwest Kiln Conference back in September. Uh, he came and took my workshop uh, here in, in Arizona I don't know, four years ago, maybe. So um, he does that kind of work, but uh, his more contemporary work is like this, lots of scraffito. And you can see that's a really nice, impressive work. So uh, there's a lot you can do with that. Reminds me of woodland block for printing. Yeah, yeah, it is like a wood block. Uh -huh, like a, uh, What do they call those? Like in old illustrations, if you look at old books and stuff, they always have those uh, wood carvings. So... um. In a different life, I was um, working to revive a, a breed of dogs, an old-time Scotch Collie, and um, I would go back to these old books that were published in like the late 1700s, early 1800s, with illustrations of different dog breeds. Um, and there's a guy, oh, I should know his name. Anyways, he, um, he, he, uh, he did some of the earliest illustrations of, of Collies, and, um, and they're really great, and they're all that kind of wood carving uh, blocks, yeah, like that. Okay, uh, so the next one I have here is uh, incised. So this is uh, this is an example from uh, the Mills collection in in Safford. Uh, so it was excavated here in southeast Arizona, and it's kind of sloppy, you know. Uh, but in my opinion, it has some charm to it too. You know, the the sloppiness adds to a little bit to a. A sort of charm that it has in my opinion so you can see that the outside was not finished very smooth and the incisions were just made kind of haphazard but um i think it's i think it's lovely i would love to have this you know sitting in my house if i had the option so uh, i don't think the sloppiness is a problem i'm going to show you some more advanced uh, examples in just a minute but this is my local example and out at the ruin that i own uh down by the chiricahua mountains we get uh, we get incised shirts fairly frequently. I mean, I wouldn't say they were ten percent of the decorated wear or anything like that, but um, but we do find incised wear, and I think most of that is coming out of northern Mexico. I don't know if it's Sonora or Chihuahua. So Sonora and Chihuahua are the two states uh, just south of Arizona, New Mexico, and they have a a mountain range that divides Mexico the same way like the Rockies divide the United States, and so um, you know. It makes a big cultural division. So uh, west of the Sierra Madre, at the big range that divides Mexico, west of the Sierra Madre, uh, we have uh, uh, Sonora. And east of the Sierra Madre, we have Chihuahua. And so they're, they're very culturally distinct, uh, even though both of them are real close here. And from my ruin, they're just, you know, a day's walk in either direction. You could tap into either one of those, the cultures from those areas. So um, like I said, we get a lot of it. I think it's coming out of Mexico. I don't know, you know, where exactly. Let me uh, move forward. Now, in, in size, where it's just, you just take a stick or something, you know, sharp, and you just, uh, you know, carve just light 
designs into the pot. Now this could be done wet. In this case, I think it was done while the pot was still quite damp. Um, but it can be done after it's dry before it's fired too, um, depending on the sharpness you know, of your stick. So if you go east from here, over into the Mississippi Valley, you know, in, in uh, the central United States, uh, the prehistoric pottery of uh, the mound builder cultures and the Mississippian culture out there did a lot. They didn't do much painting like they do here in the Southwest. They did a lot of this incised. And some of this is, like I said, incised wet. Uh, and some of it is incised after the pot is kind of burnished and finished. And then you take a sharp object and you uh, scribe those uh, designs into it. I did a little one of those uh, not long ago in that ancient potters club. We did a little, um, this is, I guess, the kind of drinking mugs that they had back in Mississippian era. And uh, I incised it. It's not, I don't know if you can see that. It's not very good. It's not very good. And this was done, um, this was done after when it was about leather hard. Um, so that was my, this is probably the only incised where I've ever attempted uh, and then I've got one more example to show you. And this is another uh, Eastern uh, United States area prehistoric pot. And that's just, it, just exemplary work. Just beautiful. Just even the shape of the pot. And again, you know, you could do something like this uh, and not use glaze. And nobody would say anything about, uh, you know, how terrible it is. They would say, wow, this is really something. And if you wanted to use it, you could glaze the interior and still leave the exterior um, more like this. So there's a lot of things you can do, you know, and not use glaze. Reminds me, uh, are some tempers and decorations better for cookware than others? Uh, so Seth Fishing One wants to know if uh, some tempers and decorations are better for cookware than others. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of talk, like in the American Southwest, uh, the corrugated pot, and we'll get to corrugated in a little bit were used almost exclusively for cookware. And so then a lot of people say, well, these make really great cooking pots because uh, they won't boil over or they heat up fast because they have more surface area. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, science supports that. Um, they did some study back uh, in the 90s with corrugated pots, and I think they proved that uh, they're more durable. So uh, because they have all that texture, they get little micro fractures, and that keeps them from breaking wide open. It allows them to kind of absorb the heating and cooling expansion contraction that a pot goes through. Um, I've never heard that certain tempers are better, but certainly cooking pots generally have more temper than pots that aren't for cooking, and that kind of helps them uh, survive longer. So um, decorations, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, honestly, if you're putting it over fire, a lot of decorations are going to become obscured, right? So if you paint it, if you put a painted pot over the fire, it's going to become black and you're not going to see the painted decorations. Whereas a corrugated pot or an incised pot, you might still see the decorations through the soot. So that's something to think about. Uh, Behenders 52 says, Southeastern woodland pottery also uses textures from corn cob and woven materials. Oh, yes, I've seen some of that. And we will get to that uh, cord mark in a little bit, which they also use down there. Okay, so that uh, that's incised. Let's move down to carved. Um, give me a second. So this is um, this is a Native American piece from uh, New Mexico, one of the pueblos in New Mexico. I'm not sure if it's San Ildefonso or Santa Clara, most likely because it's that smudged black where they make very fine carving. Um, but this is a this is actually the simplest uh, example of carving that I have. The other two are more elaborate. But this uh, I start out with a simple one, you know, and move up. For one thing, it shows you you know what you can do without getting too involved. I mean. I think any one of us, given the right carving tools and enough time, could do something like this. Uh, and you could just use a pencil and draw out the design on the pot. Uh, uh, greenware, this is unfired, this isn't bisqueware or anything. Carve in, and then, you know, you have to leave your pottery fairly thick if you're going to carve. Uh, and then carve out the designs and fire it. There's no painting involved. There is some burnishing, and we'll talk about burnishing today as well. But uh, it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. I think anybody could do this, and it's really a stunning piece. Does the corrugation distribute heat better? I've had smooth pots crack more than incised or corrugated. Uh, I don't know about the incised, but like I said, uh, there's a study. Um, I tell you what, 
after the live stream is over, I will add the link to the study down in the doobly-doo for this uh, live stream video, okay? So you can go back and check that. There was a study done in the 90s, and they, they made uh, Clint Swink, a friend of mine, uh, he made like 50 or 100 corrugated pots, all the same size, all the same corrugation, all the same shape, you know, identical pots. And then this archaeologist went and he, and he cooked in them, and he, he did studies to see, you know, what the effects of the corrugation were, why corrugated would be um, uh, sought after for cooking pots. And um, he said that it, um, it, uh, it, it made them last longer, that they endured uh, longer, whereas a smooth pot would eventually, after from heating and cooling and heating and cooling, which causes expansion contraction, uh, a smooth pot would eventually break. The corrugated pot would, would have a little longer shelf life. Now, my friend John Olson, uh, who is a master corrugator, and he, he hangs out with a lot of primitive skills people. So these are people that go up in the woods and actually live this you know, primitive lifestyle. And, and uh, they don't just talk the talk. They walk the walk. They go up there, and they, and they might actually live, you know, cook out of corrugated pots for weeks or months on end or something, right? So he knows a lot of these sorts of people. And he says that he's had corrugated pots, um, that, that corrugated pots uh, don't, last longer that any of these pots will do just fine for long periods of time as cooking pots uh that he doesn't believe that the corrugation makes them last longer uh, he just says if they're made right they'll last longer so uh i guess this your verdict is still out uh distribute heat yeah so a corrugated pot from what i've heard um and i i have very limited experience because i don't make corrugated pottery um i haven't spent a lot of time using corrugated pottery but i've heard that um it's difficult to boil over a, a corrugated pot because of the, the distribution of heat. So when it comes to heating up, you've got heat on the bottom and you've got more surface area absorbing that heat. But above the heat, above the fire, you also have more surface area, you know, transpiring heat, getting rid of heat. So they say that kind of evens out, right? That it's any advantage you have for more surface area on the bottom is lost because you have more surface area on the top as well. Only probably if you corrugated just the bottom of the pot would that advantage actually help you. Um, but they say it won't boil over because as soon as it starts to boil up, uh, that corrugation allows that heat to dissipate more quickly and it'll, it'll go back down. So it's hard to boil over or impossible to boil over a corrugated pot from what I've heard. Uh, the surface texture on corrugated would give you a better gripping surface, even using a piece of leather to protect your hands. Yes, I've heard that too, Ren Pixie, and that's a good point. Uh, it could give you a little bit of um, texture, uh, you know, to make it not slippery, especially if you're cooking in it. They could get s slippery from moisture as well as grease. Do you burnish the surface before carving the design or after? Uh, I believe, uh, like I said, I, I haven't done this, from what I've seen, that Pueblo potters burnish the whole pot and then carve it out. But uh, I don't think it's impossible to say that if you didn't, as long as it was relatively smooth to start with, that you could carve it and then burnish it. Uh, so most Pueblo potters actually, um, they, they don't work exactly the way I do. They allow the pot to become completely dry. Then they sand it. Um, then they slip it and then they burnish it. So it wouldn't matter. Even if it was bone dry, they could still, if they needed to, um, slip and burnish those areas around the carving. It'd just be more work because when you're burnishing a large area, it's easier, right? You just burnish, burnish, burnish. But if you're burnishing in those carved, you know, you'd have to be really careful. And I think it'd take more time. So I think it would be better, more efficient to, to burnish and then carve. But if you look at this one, it almost looks like the burnish kind of rolls over the top of that edge a little bit. Those edges are a little beveled, that right where it comes into the carved area. And, and I think even if it was burnished before, I think they definitely touched it up after. Otherwise, those edges would be a lot sharper. Um, it would be so hard to burnish those edges, in my opinion, and keep them detailed. Yeah, but look look at the edge. Uh, rye M, look at the edge. See how it kind of, it's a little bit curved? It's a little beveled on that edge. And the, and the polish kind of runs over that. So they had to have done at least some burnishing, I think, afterward. Anyways, uh, moving right along, let's go to the next carved one. And this one is a lot more elaborate. You can see that they carved the rim into a stair step design and they carved those ribs and around the edge at the top of those ribs, there's a little carved detail. This is a lot of work. And it was definitely burnished after it was carved because the polished edges go clear down inside of those little uh, ripples there. So 
uh, somebody put a lot of work. In. Well, I, I would guess it'd be unusual to find a body clay that is that brilliantly red. Um, but perhaps I would say probably this is carved and slipped and burnished. This is a real piece of art. Uh, and let's move on and see what the next one holds. And here's another carved piece. This one uh, also elaborate, but very different from the last one. Now, this almost looks like a Northwest Coast uh, native design to me, you know, like what you'd find up in Washington, Oregon, British Columbia. Okay, so that's carved. Let's move down um, and look at cord impressed. So uh, this is actually a little cord impressed pot from ancient China. Uh, very interesting and, and beautiful design. I even love the fire clouds all over it. It's unbelievable. Uh, so we get cord impressed here. Um, now, all over the Southwest, cord impressed is, is pretty rare. But again, like the incised, I think it's coming out of northern Mexico somewhere, either Sonora or Chihuahua. And so over at my ruin, and like I said, it's just like incised. It's not 10%. It's probably not even like 2% of the decorated wear. But occasionally, I do find cord impressed shirts. Um, you know, often enough that I could say I probably find a cord and press shirt once a year, okay, which, which is remarkable if you go around the Southwest as a whole, you almost never find cord and press. So, uh, like I said, we're close to the Mexican border and I think it's coming north. I think down in Chihuahua, uh, Casas Grandes culture, I think there's quite a bit of cord and press or a fair amount and it's coming up out of there. So, um, it's like. Uh, Pacific Northwest Salish art. Yes, I, that's kind of what I was thinking. The corn design. Yeah, that was great. I love that too. Very good. Uh, is there any word for this type of stair detail where it's part of the pot? Um, yeah, I don't know what if there's a name for that. Uh, we're talking about that stair step that was carved into the uh, the rim, but it looked to me like um, what you'll see on Kiva steps. So um, it reminds me of the, the steps that lead up to a Kiva in New Mexico Pueblo culture. So that's what that would be my guess on that and it's just a guess okay so the other way uh, that we can put cord um, details on a pot and this is common in the east in like woodland culture so um, not here in the American Southwest but Eastern North America um, and and they'll actually wrap a bit of cord around a stick and then they'll paddle it all over to give it a rough texture and that's a great way to add um, some detail to your pot uh, and like, again, like Ren Pixie was saying how the corrugated gives you, um, a grip, you know, this would add a little texture that might give you a grip, a, a cooking pot. So, um, my friend, uh, Sherilyn Caver in, uh, Eastern Colorado, she does a Plains Woodland pottery that they find out on the Plains and, and she does something similar with that to give it that, uh, cord mark texture. And here's an example of some of the cord and press that we get here in my area. So out at my ruin, I'm finding, you know, tiny little sherds of this stuff. This is a whole vessel of it. And this is in the museum in Deming. They have a really great historical museum in Deming, New Mexico, that has a lot of uh, prehistoric pottery on display. So if you ever get over to Deming, or if you're driving on I-10 and you're passing through Deming, um, stop and see if you can visit this museum. They have a lot of nice stuff. Uh, specifically, they have a lot of Membris and they have a lot of uh, Chihuahuan, you know, Casas Grandes style. And that's what this is. I think this is Belford Red Cord Impressed or something like that. And um, it's just really beautiful. And I know this picture probably doesn't carry the detail uh, needed, but uh, those, all those horizontal lines up by the neck are tiny little cords that have been pressed into the damp clay to give it texture. So very beautiful. Um, Grateful for your channel, says CJS 1990C. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Chris in Kansas. Hey, Chris. Uh, more surface area, heat efficient. Uh, like I was saying, Chris, I think um, from what I've heard, and, you know, I have no experience with um, cooking with corrugated. I, I just, because I don't make corrugated. Um, from what I've heard, you get more heat efficiency on the bottom when it's sitting on the fire or the coals, right? But you lose it on the top because it's corrugated all the way up. So any heat efficiency you gain, you also lose. I think the only way, like remember when we were, I don't know how old you are. Okay. I was going to say when we were kids. When when I was a kid, my mom had pans and you used to see them around. I, don't, I haven't seen them in years. So they used to have pans that were copper on the bottom only. 
And, and the story was that the copper on the bottom of the pan was more efficient at collecting and distributing heat than like whatever they usually put on pans. And they would put the copper only on the bottom, right? Um, so I think, um, I think it would only work if you only corrugated the bottom, you'd get that heat efficiency. But if you corrugate all the way up, I think you lose that because then you're losing heat as well. Anyways, that's my thought on, um, on heat efficiency uh, in corrugated pots, Chris. Okay, so that does it for cord and pressed. Uh, now we're actually gonna talk about uh, what everybody's been talking about, corrugated. So uh, what we call corrugated here in the Southwest is really just like um, very fine, uh, you know, the finger pinches when you attach your coils that aren't obliterated. So when we make a coil pot, you, you press those coils into the body and then, you know, you, you end up scraping away all the, the texture that's left. In, a, in what we call corrugated, that texture is left on purpose. And so this is a great example of a beautiful, big corrugated pot with really fine uh, corrugation. Revere wear, that's right. Uh, so here is, uh, this is the pot that I purchased from um, uh, Tory Hoops up in Concho this summer. And uh, really nice. It's got some great fire clouds too. You can see that's that's what corrugated looks like. It's got a texture all over it. And uh, up in the northern southwest, not so much down here, those were the cooking pots. Uh, that's what they, you know, and, and you know they were the cooking pots. They're all covered in soot and stuff where they were down in the coals all the time. So uh, very beautiful. I've got a video that I did uh, last, I think it came out like the 1st of June last year with John Olson showing how to do this technique. So... If you're interested in learning how to do that, uh, just search for John Olson or corrugated pottery and you should be able to find that. And that's that's good. That's about 25 minutes. And then recently um, for my channel members, for, uh, for channel members on my YouTube channel, I put up the whole, John's whole class. So if you're really interested in corrugated, uh, that's an hour and a half almost of corrugating lesson. So I, I took the whole time that John was corrugating and talking about how to do it and giving tips and all of it. And I, and I put it all up there, hour and a half lesson. So, um, if you're not, if you're a channel member and you're interested in corrugated, go look at that. I just put it up like two days ago. If you're not a channel member and you're interested in that, uh, you can buy the lowest level. You can buy the plane work, uh, membership and get access to that video. So if you are interested in corrugated, uh, it, it's not even expensive to get access to that. Like I said, hour and a half of corrugated lesson. Um, Granny Goose, great to see you live, Andy. Can you make red paint by simply mixing red clay with a bit of organic binder? Yeah, you don't even have to mix organic binder. If it's red clay, just paint it on, you know. Uh, yeah, clay by itself makes a great uh, paint or slip, so uh, there's no need to mix organic binder if it's just clay. The only reason you would need binder is if you were using, like, ground-up hematite and it didn't have any... You know, because it's just powdered rock. It doesn't have any stickiness. Clay has stickiness naturally. And so then adding that binder gives it stickiness so it sticks to your brush, it flows onto the pot, those kind of things. Uh, yeah, Revere Rare. Copper clad bottom, stainless steel body. My mom had a bunch of those Ren Pixie. Those, those, but see, that's what I'm saying, though. They didn't copper the whole thing. They coppered only the bottom. And I think if you want anywhere at the top, which could be done, it just wouldn't be as attractive, right? <laughs> so uh, let's see move on to the next corrugated pot uh so here is one uh where the, there's no pinch marks so this i took this at the mills collection over in safford uh if you ever get to safford arizona eastern arizona college has an amazing collection of pottery prehistoric pottery and uh, so so not all corrugated have uh the pinch marks that you see here right uh in some cases it's just it's just the coils uh, which is its own sort of attractive design and there's a lot of things you can do with corrugated. There's a million different corrugated. Uh, there's different pinches. There's different designs. There's different ways of doing it. Uh, like John Olson um, in that video, he shows, I think, four different ways of pinching just, just in that brief time I was there. And he knows many more. He knows a lot. In fact, I could take a picture of a shirt. If I go to a ruin and see a corrugated shirt, I'll take a picture and John will go out and make a pot of it. And he'll be like, oh, this is how you do that. So he's got all these uh, corrugated techniques in his head. And some people spend many, many years just perfecting different corrugated techniques. So, 
very fun and uh, there's endless possibilities. Uh, so here is a picture of John and he was, um, he was making a tiny, so after he made, the one he made in the video was a bowl about this big. Um, and then we were sitting around his, his yard all afternoon talking. And so while we were talking, he made this tiny little uh, pot, corrugated. And, and John, uh, if you ever meet him, he's got, he's got massive hands, right? Like, looks like a construction worker. He's a big guy, but his hands are way bigger than mine. He's big fingers, you know? And, and, uh, and he made this pot that has the tiniest little pinches. If you just saw the pot, you'd swear like a very small, petite person made it. Uh, but those tiny pinches are not indicative of the size of the hand making it. So he gave me that pot. I took it home. I fired it myself. I have it in my house. It's, it's, it's maybe this big, very small, uh, and just beautiful, just really nice. So yeah, you can see this, the coil he's using is, um, you know, it's smaller than a, it's significantly smaller than a pencil. You know, it's, it's say uh, uh, this, the same goes for buying it at the store as going out in the woods and looking for it, you know, in nature. You're looking for a nice, colorful clay. Well, chances are, you know, it, you know, it cracks easy. It shrinks too much. You know, for some reason you don't, or if you're out in nature and you find it, you know, that red clay or that yellow clay, it's a, it's a layer that's like two inches thick. And so it would take you all day to get a bucket full of that stuff, but you could get enough to put in your hands pretty easily. And so uh, this much clay can go a long way. It could slip many, many pots but you're not going to make much of a pot with this much clay. So you build the pot out of the gray or brown clay that has the good working properties. And then you, you, you know, just like your house, right? You cover it in a nice coat of colorful paint. And in this case, that paint is just clay. It's colorful clay. And so uh, what we see here in this picture, uh, the white clay in the container on the left is painted on the face of the pot on the right and on the neck of the pot on the left. And the yellow clay in the container on the right is painted all over that red pot on the left. So it is, fires red um, and the white clay fires white. And those are painted over the pot to make them more attractive. The pot on the right, that kind of orangey brown color is actually the color of the pot, the clay it was formed from. So that's an example showing how we can, sometimes you can paint right on top of the body clay if that's what you're after. And sometimes you might want to add some slip and then paint the black paint or as a mineral paint was painted right on top of that slip. So different ways to approach, but slips just give you some color, uh, allows you to, you know, give that pot the, you know, the color you want. And a lot of times, like it's that yellow clay, it, it would be hard to get enough of that yellow clay to build many pots, but I can get, and it's a long ways from me. But I can get clay here in the Tucson area that's usable that I could build many pots from. And then with this little bit of yellow clay I have, I can slip many, many pots. So it's economical. Um, Chris Dawson, internet is bad where I am today. Video keeps spinning. Ugh, we'll have to watch after the live feed. Sorry about that, Chris. Granny Goose, it's not you, Chris. The stream is having a hard time. Oh, is that true? Uh, let's see what YouTube tells me. YouTube's telling me right now that the stream you're not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. I wonder why it does that. It was doing fine right up until about 1030 or so, I think it looks like. Huh. Sorry guys, this is the um, story of my life on this. It happens to me every stinking time. And I'm losing, I'm losing viewers too, so. Uh, okay, moving on to the next slip picture. I'll just keep going forward. So here's my teapot. Uh, I formed this teapot with um, just brown local clay. Uh, I, I and then I slipped it because brown clay wasn't you know brown wasn't the color I was after, so uh, I slipped it with white clay down below and then I slipped some yellow up above that and if you can't see the foot but I slipped the foot yellow as well and I just I just painted it on you know and I just drew the line I needed on there um, so you can slip with different colors and my next example 
uh, is another good, uh oh, hold on. So the next one is another example of uh, using different slips. So uh, I just painted that white slip in right where I wanted it. You know, just like I was painting a design. Basically, I painted a line all the way around. You don't have to be the whole pot. You could slip just the areas you want and get the colors you want. And in some ways, uh, slip is like, um, some ways slip can be like uh, glaze because, uh, you know, you're just adding color to the outside of the pot. I mean, isn't that what a, you know, nine times out of 10, your glaze isn't to make it waterproof on the outside of a pot. It's, it's to add color or decorative elements. Uh, but this doesn't give you that glassy finish. This gives you more of a, a matte finish that highlights the texture of the clay itself, which is to me, uh, you know, one of the attractions of using slip. I don't know. It said that you guys were saying it was good and now it's, it said it was okay and now it says it's bad again. I don't know what to tell you. I apologize. So, uh, yeah, the slip is just adding uh, colors to the pot and that's just using different colored clays. I'm going to move right along. Uh, burnishing is another way of... Um, decorating the outside of a pot. And burnishing is usually done um, on top of either the body clay or slip. So uh, the examples I showed you of slipping earlier that were mine, um, you know, I, I later slipped those, those, I mean, I later burnished those slips as well so that they were shiny. Uh, but it's not necessary. It's not always, uh, burnishing is not always done on top of slips. Uh, and slip, and burnishing is not always done, burnishing is not always done on top of slips. Um, it can be it can be done right on the body clay or um, it can be not at all. So burnishing just adds gloss to it and burnishing is done while the pot is still a little damp. Now if the pot is fully dry like Pueblo potters work, um, then you can wet it. You can use a little spray bottle or, um, or just uh, brush some water on the surface, get it damp and then polish it. So it needs to be a damp pot. In this case, uh, the one in the picture there, it was damp. I work, I burnish while the pot is damp. Uh, let's see, where am I at here? So, uh, transition to the next one here. This is that little uh, red pot that I made last January. And uh, I burnished the heck out of that. And it's really shiny looking in this picture. It says I have excellent condition now. So hopefully uh, that's the case, guys. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry about the internet. I don't... Uh, so, yeah, so this is just uh, slip. This is slipped with that yellow clay that I showed you in a, a previous slide. And, uh, and then I just burnished the heck out of it. And if you're getting a good shine, it's good to burnish once while it's still a little damp. Kind of set that material in there. Kind of establish that firm surface. And then let it dry a little more. And then come back and burnish again. And then let it dry a little more and come back and burnish again. The really good ones like this pot here, I usually get three burnishings uh, to get that really good gloss. Okay. Uh, just did a burnished red bottom on the pot. And it's so solid and gorgeous. Three coats. Shiny, shiny. Good for you, Granny Goose. All right, uh, one more picture of burnished, and this is a Pueblo pot. Uh, so this is what they call a melon jar. It has those ribs uh, on it, and then burnished, burnished real nice. So this is an example of a of a burnished plainware pot. Uh, it's not there's no de design, there's no painting. It's just beautiful the way it is. Of course, it has uh, that melon jar, but even if it didn't have that, it would still be beautiful because of that. Now those those ribs. You know, that's a more challenging shape to burnish, but I think the results really speak for themselves. Uh, let's talk about mineral paint. Okay, if I can get this to go. This is a Wingate black on red pot, uh, prehistoric pot. So uh, it was uh, made out of a gray clay. It was slipped uh, with a yellow slip, such as you saw earlier. It was burnished really good with a stone, and then it was painted with um, black uh, mineral paint. 
probably a manganese based paint. So uh, I have some videos showing how I've done that, making mineral paint and using mineral paint, finding the minerals for making paint, if you're interested in that. I brought you a, a nice example of mineral painted pot. This is uh, Bobby Silas's um, Sikyakti polychrome jar that we traded for at the kiln conference. And these are mineral based paints. So um, that black paint uh, in the video I made about Bobby, he shows him mixing the black paint on his little palette. Uh, using uh, natural stones uh, and then um, the orangey kind of color here that reddish orange color I think is his uh, his yellow paint and um, the white is white clay um, the yellow the orange might be a yellow clay too but the black is definitely a mineral paint so a lot of prehistoric pottery and even modern uh, Pueblo pottery uses um, mineral paint uh, and so that's a good example of mineral paint. And that, it wouldn't be much different from using like an underglaze. You know, it's just something that uh, adds color that you paint on in a decoration. <laughs> uh, Elante Dave, uh, your, your message was held for review. I burnished my first pookie last week and it fired beautifully. I have no idea what they thought that was. They're like, we don't want you talking about burnishing your pookie. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can turn that on. Can I do it? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, but you burnished a pookie, Alanit Dave? I mean, are we using the right terminology, right? A pookie is, um, is the bowl, the little shallow dish that we form the bottom of the pot with. Did you literally burnish your pookie? Because I can't say of a burnished pot. This is uh, Ron Carlos, Ron Carlos's work. Really fine. And that's a slip. So you can see inside or right at the rim that it's a brownware pot uh, with a red slip that is just burnished like crazy. And Ron Carlos does fine work. And this is not, he doesn't use sandpaper either. So this is, he just and um, slips and burnishes them. So he's not, he's not even like, cheating by using sandpaper. That's real quality work right there. <laughs> um, hello from Minnesota, Airstream Wanderings. Hey, uh, so we're talking about uh, mineral paint. Let me show you another example of mineral paint. And this is uh, the inside of a, a whole calm red on buff bowl. A real fine kind of a grid pattern. Beautiful work. And this is just uh, hematite paint. So that's what they use. They just the, the buff color is the body clay. That's the clay they built the pot from. And then the red is, uh, is just a hematite, like an iron oxide, basically, uh, paint. And, uh, and that's a really good example of mineral paint here in the Southwest. And then one more example of mineral paint, uh, Members Pottery. You know, the finest example of mineral paint. They do such really detailed, fine line work that, you know, makes my eyes bleed. So, uh Fine, fine, fine. And that is the same paint as the whole karma we're using. Uh, that's just red iron oxide paint. So um, in this case, in the member's case, it was fired in a reduction atmosphere. In the whole con case, it was fired in an oxidizing atmosphere. And that determines whether that red, that iron oxide goes red or black based on how it's fired. So uh, let's move on. I have one more type that I've covered nine uh, different types of... Um, pottery decorations so far, okay? Do you remember what they are? Uh, applique, sgraffito, incised, carved, cord impressed, corrugated, slipped, burnished, mineral paint, and I saved the best for last because um, the last example is organic paint, which is what I'm currently kind of working on. So organic paint is, is kind of unique to the Southwest boiled down and then I strain all the solids out and then just keep cooking it until it's just it feels like plastic or maybe like a soft rubber um, and when I want to use it I just add a little water mix it up paint it on the pot now paint it on the pot looks something like this see how it's kind of glossy that's the paint that's the organic paint it's not going to stay that way so uh, once it gets in a fire that organic material that plant matter burns away and leaves you with uh, black uh, carbon black designs so organic paint is a very unique process to the southwest and this particular example that i have here on the screen is a um, what they call a kiva jar that are found up in the uh, mesa verde area and most of that mesa verde black on white pottery 
Uh, from prehistoric times, this was like, what, 900 to 1250, something like that, I think. And I'm, I'm just guessing because that's not my specific area of expertise, but somewhere in there, uh, they made this beautiful black on white, Mesa Verde black on white pottery using organic paint and firing in those trench kilns. Now, let me show you another example. This is uh, the kind that I'm working on making uh, this season, and that is, uh, you know, Salado Polychrome. So painted red in areas. As you can see, this bowl is red on the outside and then uh, slipped. It's entirely slipped. It's brown ware clay. It slipped red on the outside. It slipped white on the inside. And then that organic paint, which fires black. So this picture, this particular bowl came from uh, Colorado. A very fine example of oxidized organic paint, whereas the the Mesa Verde stuff we looked at a little bit ago is not oxidized or what Clint calls limited oxidation. So you oxidize enough to burn all the carbon clouds out of it, but not so much that you're burning the paint out of it. Whereas with this one, we have to oxidize because we want those reds to turn red. If it's not oxidized, they'll be brown or dingy gray. So uh, that's part of the process. Uh, and I have one more example. And we're going to go back to the Mesa Verde area again. And this is uh, my friend Bob Casillas, who's one of the organizers for the Southwest Kiln Conference. And this is, uh, a, he's done a membrous design. Now, remember I told you membrous pottery was mineral paint. This is a membrous design that has been painted with organic paint. Bob does a lot of these uh, because the process for making organic paint pottery is, is a little simpler and, uh, you know, easier at least for Bob and so he makes membrous type pottery with organic paint because that's a simpler process for him and he makes very beautiful work so uh, there's no uh, faulting him on that it's really gorgeous and it comes out real good and that's made with Rocky Mountain bee plant uh, let's see hello from this hell for you okay so Lanet Dave says I did I just to see what would happen, I used an old glass insulator as a polisher. Yeah, you can use, like I use polishing stones, but you can use anything. The back end of a spoon uh, down in Mata Ortiz, uh, engine, engine push rods or something. Anyways, all kinds of things can be used, that, anything smooth for, uh, for burnishing pottery. Uh, so good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, organic paint. Uh, bentonite white slip comes out dusty when dry. Any ideas? Hmm comes out dusty like it's not this is uh Stephen Walford it's not sticking to the pot like after the pot's dry you can you can brush it off is that what you mean by dusty because I've never had that experience I did buy a packet of bentonite and I tried it on a pot and it worked for me so not sure but uh Stephen one thing you can do if you're using something that isn't adhering to the pot well or is, when it's dry is coming off when it's damp, if you go over it with a stone, with a burnishing stone, uh, while the pot's still damp, then you're pressing those particles into that damp clay and they become more permanent. You might try giving it a very light polish with a polishing stone to see if that helps set it. Now, I'm planning a video soon where I will be testing making Salado polychrome using store-bought materials, and that includes that store-bought bentonite. So um, I may be going down that path very soon. So um, if that's the case, Stephen, um, send me an email. I'd be glad to uh, help you troubleshoot that problem. Hello from the Virgin Islands. Uh, U.S. or British? Z the Zen Shields. All righty. Uh, I covered all of these processes, okay? I got, the, uh, I got the Bobby Silas pot. I've got the Ron Carlos pot, mi mineral paint. Burnishing. I've got uh, I've got Tory hoops, big old corrugated here to illustrate corrugated pottery. We talked about incising and carving. You got questions, people? We've got a couple more minutes if you have any. Yeah, come off with my fingers, huh? Yeah, I uh, well, Stephen, I, I don't know. Like I said, I I have experimented with bentonite. I never had that experience, but I bet if you if you gave it a polish while it was still damp, it might help firm that up and set it and and it would possibly solve your problem so give that a shot and i am going to be doing some some pottery with store-bought bentonite very soon so um if that is a problem i will probably run into it but I, it could be it could be the source of bentonite right like if i order bentonite off the internet mine might come from one and it's cooler when they're from foreign countries so if you were from the u.s virgin islands it would be less interesting than british 
<laughs> uh, okay, guys, uh, I've got six minutes, so uh, if you got any questions, let's see. I can see if I have anything here to show you. Uh, so, um, so I got my, um, I got my um, uh, liquid quartz. Anybody here from Australia or familiar with liquid quartz? So I bought this uh, liter of liquid quartz uh, from the internet, hundred and fifty dollars roughly, uh, and then like sixty five dollars shipping or something like that to get it shipped here from Australia. And um, and I treated the this little mug with it, and that liquid literally beads up on it now. So um, super cool. And I have a video coming out next week on uh, liquid quartz. Do you have any knowledge on Swedish ceramics? I'm just getting into ceramics here in Sweden. I, I can't say that I know anything about Swedish ceramics, but I would definitely be interested in hearing what you find out. Um, I'm Sage, Sage Smoke Survival says, I'm curious, do you ever get accused of cultural appropriation by making these? Um, you know, Sage Smoke Survival, uh, I have a lot of friends who are archaeologists and a lot of friends who are natives um, who appreciate what I'm doing um, because, you know, I'm not making Hopi pottery. I'm making uh, pottery from cultures that uh, don't exist anymore. Uh, so, but every once in a while you get somebody who's, uh, you know, who's angry. But you can't please all the people all the time. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that we're abandoned then that we're trying to understand how they were made. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, some people have problems, but like I said, you can't please everybody. Um, but I certainly, you know, I certainly am sensitive to those kind of issues. I have friends that are Native Americans, for crying out loud. Uh, can I add sand to buff stoneware to make low-fired cooking pots? Yeah, I would. I would try it. Uh, these these Zen Essentials. I, I, like, I, if you saw my video... Um, a while back where I went, I went down to Hobby Lobby. I bought just regular old clay off the shelf. Uh, I put a bunch of sand into it and I fired it with charcoal briquettes in my yard. It got up to something around 700 degrees Celsius and it's fine. In fact, it's right. Oh, it's in a box because it's part of the giveaway. Um, so yeah, I, I think you can, but, uh, test it out, you know, because every clay is different. Uh, you know, Try it and see how it works and then test it and see if it's working, you know, if it actually made good ceramics. There's only one way to do it, and that's to find out. Uh, tips and tricks around founding cl finding clay in nature. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got lots of videos on that. Um, Mons Palmberg. Uh, too much to go into now. Uh, when I go out looking for clay, I look for tracks in the road. If, if, if when it was muddy, the tracks, you know, the car tracks were put in, and then when it dried, they stayed, they held their shape. That implies that there's some clay there. It's, it's hard, right? The little chunks are hard. I look for that crackled texture in nature. If the ground is expansive, that is it expands when wet, contracts when dry, that implies there's clay in the soil. Uh, look along our uh, stream and riverbeds, you know. But there, I have a lot of videos on that, Mon, so check those out. Alexander, Andy, are ant hills a source of good clay? Not in my area. Uh, I don't know. You're in Africa, so, I mean, things may be very different, but... Um, I, I saw some videos online where they were making stuff out of like termite mounds or something. But uh, here where I live, ant hills are, are full of sand, not clay. Like lots and lots of little pebbles and sand. So, um, Airstream Wanderings, I think your efforts to contribute, uh, your efforts contribute a lot to the understanding of ancient cultures is much appreciated. Thanks, uh, Airstream Wanderings. The other thing that uh, pottery like this does is um, uh, that helps, you know, Native Americans is that. Uh, these these old ruins, these these prehistoric ruins, are being looted for pots because people buy these. You can go on eBay and and buy prehistoric pottery, and and when you do that, you're encouraging people going out and digging up these ruins. And so these ruins are a non-renewable resource that are being destroyed by people who aren't taking any records or measurements. We're not learning anything from it. We're just grabbing the art out and selling it. Um, by making replicas, uh, authentic replicas, um, I am making it so you, you don't have to buy these artifacts. You want one of these in your house, you can have one that didn't come from a ruin. You're not paying a looter for his efforts. You're paying an artist for his efforts, you see. So in some ways, replicas actually uh, are, are helping uh, Native Americans in that uh, they're... they're um, their heritage is not being destroyed uh, by looters. So you can think about it that way too. 
All right, guys, uh, it's 11 o'clock. I thank you all for uh, coming. I thank you for sticking through the bad internet. Um, and I hope you have a great week and a great uh, December because that starts tomorrow. Uh, Mon says there a heat limit for cooking cookable pots or can you use any pot for safe cooking? No, uh, it's going to vary from, from clay to clay and you're going to probably want to put a lot of temper in those pots for cooking. Uh, so it, you're going to experiment. You're going to you're going to grab your best clay and you're going to put a lot of temper in it, maybe like 30 percent. And then you're going to make the pot and then you're going to test it. You're going to put it on the stove or in the fire, or wherever you're cooking, and you're going to see how it works out. And, you know, if it survives. So because every clay is different, uh, but you are going to put a lot of temper into it, Mons. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.